antagonist Whose love is mighty And so much stronger The King of glory The King above all kings And who shakes the whole earth With holy thunder And who leaves us breathless And all in wonder The King of glory the King above all kings This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You lay down your life and Set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me and Who brings our chaos Back into order And who makes the open a son and daughter, the King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all kings.
how joyful still your love all for me Cause you have been so, so good to me Oh yes you have But I felt no worth all you paid it all for me been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the night. And I, and I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it, still you yourself away for oh, the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God yeah No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no hall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no hall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down. Thank you for the people that you have here this morning. 
Uh, thank you for their lives, Father. Just be with them, meet their needs, Father. If they're hurting or sick, Father, just have your hand of healing and touch on them, Father. Just, um, just love on them, Father. Just thank you for this time of, uh, of offering to turn our blessings to you, to this ministry, Father. Just uh, use it to glorify you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How exciting is that? Uh, it's a lot of fun. I hate I missed it, but I'm very, very glad to be back. And I want to start our conversation off this morning with the question, and that is, do you love a good argument? No, some of us not. Do your kids love a good argument? Yeah. So I think Josiah gets it for me. I, I can be fairly argumentative. I like a good debate. My sister and I are both that way. Our family dinners around the table, I'll say we're always lively. We think very differently and we're both hard-headed. We get it from our parents. And, and so I come from this kind of the way we share love family is we argue. We're not afraid to say, hey, no, that's dumb. And here, let me tell you why. And so this is kind of who I am. And I'm starting to see that in Josiah. So if you guys want to pray for Elizabeth, I would appreciate it as she's in our household. But this morning, we're going to talk a little bit about um, being argumentative to the point of being decisive. Um, de de decisive. That's a good thing to be too, but divisive is the word I was looking for. And what that means for how we live life. So we are continuing this series through Philippians. Uh, this is living where we're talking about what does it look like to live life well? Because we believe that God wants us to live life well, that life is a gift. Uh, John 10, 10, Jesus tells us that he came that we might have life and have it abundantly. And here's what we don't believe that means. And we don't think that that means Jesus wants to give you a brand new car every year and have the biggest house and all that kind of stuff. But what we do think that means is life genuinely is a good and precious gift. And when we live life the way Jesus wants us to live life, we do find fulfillment and satisfaction. There is a uh, uh, something where we find our purpose and it is good even when life is a struggle and it's difficult and people are people it's still a good gift and my prayer for you is that you would enjoy that gift that you would live life well that you would find satisfaction and fulfillment and so we're going to continue on with that conversation this morning so if you have your bibles we're going to be in philippians we finally made it to chapter four it's been a, a good little minute, but we're finally in chapter 4. I uh, can't find my sticky note, which is the last chapter. We're going to really focus in on verses 1 through 3. Uh, we're just going to start off with verse 1. And before we do, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, we come to you. We thank you for your love and for your grace. And we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit, and we do ask right now in this moment that our hearts would be open and receptive, that our ears would be open, that we would be able to hear your word clearly, that you would work in us through the power of your spirit in this moment, that you would continue to transform us as followers of you in order to better be used by you for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, Paul starts off verse 1 of chapter 4 with, Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. And so, Paul is kind of concluding his thoughts with what we'll see in a little bit the next couple of weeks are really these issues that deal with the church. And before he gets, gets to these issues, um, things like divisiveness, things like impure thoughts, things like not being gracious, um, this is where he's headed. And before he gets there, he's reassuring this church of his love for them. And I love this. Therefore, my brothers, you could add sisters in there as well. As therefore, you people in Philippi that are the church whom I love and long for, my joy and crown. I love that. 
This church that Paul got to plant, we started off this series looking at Acts when this church was founded with a conversation that he had with Lydia. And as he's away and he's saying, look, you are my joy and crown. Like what a, man, how awesome would it be to be a part of that church? But then he gives them this imperative based on, I love you. He says, stand firm. Stand firm. Have your feet planted like a tree that is rooted in the ground where you aren't wavering. And so he's concluding how to live pretty much before he gets into how this affects our church life with make sure you are standing firm. Stand firm in your faith. Stand firm in your marriage. Stand firm in your finances. Right? When it gets to the end of the month and you ran out of money two weeks ago, how does that affect our faith? How does that affect how we live our life? Stand firm in the way you parent. It, when your kids are driving you crazy, strive. Stand firm in the fact of pointing them to the Lord to love Him and serve Him and love their neighbor. Stand firm in your vocation. When you feel like you can't give anything else, you're just burned out. Paul's saying stand firm in how you do that well. Stand firm in how you serve the Lord because let's face it, it might be easier to feel burned out uh, volunteering at church more so than a vocation sometimes. And Paul's saying, look, you stand firm. I love you. You're my joy and crown. And so heed this imperative to stand firm. In the Lord, Paul says. Just following that stand firm, you see, when we we are actually able and capable to stand firm in all of these things that intersect with our everyday lives because it's not our power, it's not our strength, it's not how good we can do. We're standing in the Lord. It's something greater than ourselves. It's not by my spirit and my strength that I'm able to love my wife the way Jesus wants me to love my wife or serve the Lord through my vocation or parent or steward money well. You see, it doesn't fall completely on me. There's something greater than myself that I stand firm in. Stand firm in the Lord. And now let's read verses 2 and 3. This is where we're really going to hang out. I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Now, I just want you to picture... You're in this church at Philippi, first century church. Um, these letters would have been read aloud at these gatherings. Now picture yourself as one of these ladies. You just got called out. I mean, you just got called out. Here Paul's writing this beautiful letter and he's closing it with, Hey you, and hey you, agree in the Lord. I don't know about you, but that I might go find another church. Somebody called me out like that. Uh, I mean, we probably wouldn't like that. And yet here's Paul making this claim. Agree in the Lord. Apparently, this disagreement is so bad that Paul feels it necessary to put it in this letter to this church at Philippi, to be read in front of everyone. And I just find that baffling. Especially in our culture of, well, we really can't offend that person. Or, this person's a fellow worker, what if they leave? Or this person, um, you know, they, they helped Clement and they've been a huge help. We better not offend this person. Paul's like, look, this is an issue that needs to be dealt with. Deal with it. Agree in the Lord. As a church family, we need to be about the same thing. You know, John 17, 20 and 21, Jesus actually prays for us. And in verse 20, prior to that, he prays for his immediate followers, the disciples. And then in verse 20, he actually prays for us. And he says this, I do not ask, this is right before he goes to the cross, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me. So if you are a follower of Jesus, this is you. Jesus is praying for you in this moment. Believe in me through their word that they may all be one. 
just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Jesus was concerned about our unity. Paul is concerned about our unity. But think about what Jesus just said. It's not unity for the sake of unity. It's not unity for the sake of kumbaya environment where we all just love life and get along. Look what Paul says. Paul. Jesus. That we might be one so that, here's the because statement, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. You see, here's why this is important. Here's why Jesus prays this prayer, I believe, and here's why Paul finds it necessary to call out this disagreement in this letter. You see, Jesus is the hope of the world. The local church is supposed to point to that hope, not stand in the way of it. And when we find ourselves always disagreeing over little things, guess what we're doing? We're standing in the way of this beautiful prayer that we would be one so that the world might believe in Jesus. I mean, think about some of the silliest arguments. If you're like me and you grew up in church, you probably have your own story to tell. Where we argue over the color of the carpet. I mean, Second Baptist Church, right, exist because they wanted red carpet. I actually, I googled um, some stuff, some things, the 25 silliest things, and you can go ahead and write this down, you can look it up, it's hilarious. The 25 silliest things the church members argue, Tom Rainer. Make, that, make a note, go look it up. Guys, I couldn't help but half of me laugh hysterically. The other half of me want to weep. Uh, one of them was funny. Um, the church was arguing if deviled eggs should be allowed at potlucks. I had an argument. There was a fight. One of them, there was a fight. Oh, golly, what was it about? And these two deacons couldn't decide on something of this church. And so they settled it in the parking lot. <laughs> And it was something silly. There was a fight uh, that came up and they were arguing about if they should buy a vacuum cleaner. At a business meeting, arguing to the death. There was one argument, the budget, the annual budget was 10 cents off. And there was a fight until somebody threw a dime in and just said it's settled. Here we are, as followers of Jesus... O oh, you, Euodia, and you, Synthache, agree in the Lord. Because what you're doing is not being used by Jesus the way he wants to use you, even as set forth in his prayer, because you're disagreeing. Now think about it. Paul in Corinthians, he calls out moral issues. Calls it straight out. Hey, that guy... He's sleeping with his dad's wife. He's gone. He's not afraid to call that out. Paul, throughout all of his letters, he's not afraid to call out wrong theological teachings. Those are important fights to be had, and Paul fights that. Apparently, this is not that. These are just two women that can't agree. Probably over the style of music, or the color of the carpet, or that Gentile and that Jew coming in, and what we're having for potluck, because that Gentile brought ribs in, and that offends me, and all the silly things that we argue over. I just, I, I love that. I just love that this is the first thing that follows. My brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, you are my joy and crown. Please stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. You, O oh loved ones, you who are loved by God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and also myself. I entreat, I beg, I plead, you and you to agree. Isn't it funny that that's the first command that follows? Isn't it? But if you think about it, this is why this is important. Because disunity is always an option. Always. In your marriage, with your kids, at work, um, with who you serve with. Disunity is always an option. It's always easy to find something to nitpick over. 
It is. So Elizabeth and I, I, I don't like sharing the toothpaste with her because she squeezes from the middle. I squeeze from the end. Do we have any other of those? Yeah. Isn't it funny, though, how when we first got married, and I was like, oh, this is cute. She squeezed it from the middle. I'm going to fix it. Make it look all pretty. And like now, nine years into it, right? You, get the, you see the toothpaste, and you're like, oh, my gosh, how hard is it to just squeeze it right? <laughs> I mean, but we let little stupid things come into our lives, and it starts to breed disunity. You see, this isn't only an option, it's a heart issue, and it impacts every aspect of our life, and how dare it impact how we follow Jesus, because we're called to be one so that the world might know that Jesus is who Jesus said he was. And when we find ourselves arguing over the right way to squeeze toothpaste, you know what we're doing? We're being ineffective. You know what we're doing when we argue over the dumb church issues that really are dumb? We're being ineffective. We're cutting our voice off from, to the world. We are. It's what we're doing. And I would hate for Paul to have to write a letter to the church at Argo Christian Fellowship and say, Hey, you and you, just agree in the Lord. I mean, think about it. Paul is 10 years away from when he planted this church. He's in prison. And apparently this disagreement is so bad, he hears about it. I mean, just think about that. Apparently it's not moral. Apparently it's not theological. And here Paul is, and he's probably heard a letter, hey, these two ladies are arguing about this. And he probably goes, you've got to be kidding me. This is my joy and crown. This is the church whom I love maybe the most that I've invested in, that I've seen blossom into this handful of people on a riverbank to this growing, healthy, vibrant church that lost people are coming in and finding Jesus. And i got to deal with this still? Because here's the thing. We're all people. And we like what we like. And disunity is always an option. And for most of us, we'll take it. We just will. It's our default. Because it's easier, right? It's easier to want to argue about things instead of saying, okay, here's the main thing. Let's focus on that. And if you... And I think some people fall into this temptation where we want to go and find that perfect church because of past stuff. And I've got past stuff in my home church, some really, really, actually some really bad stuff that should have caused disunity with staff members and affairs, and it was not pretty. But it's always easy when you find yourself into that temptation or when you find yourself in that situation or you're at this church and they're arguing about, I'm just going to go find that church that's perfect. Hey, if you find that perfect church, please don't go there because as soon as you show up, it ain't perfect no more. It's just not. See, the hard, this is, in my opinion, this is the hardest part of following Jesus. Because it's easy to want to be all about the gospel personally. Because I know who I am. And yet God loves me anyway. And he's saved me and he's called me to himself. And he saved me for a purpose. And I'm all about that. Hey, but when you put me in a room with two or three or five or 50 or 75 or a thousand other believers, things just got real difficult. I mean, right? This is the hardest part about what it means to follow Jesus because God has called us to be a community of faith making a difference in the world. And when we as unperfect people gather into a community, that community is no longer perfect and struggles are necessary and thus the importance to stand firm in the Lord. You see, we should keep the main thing the main thing. The point is a person and his name is Jesus. And our goal as believers should be to be used to answer Jesus' prayer in John 17, 20 and 21, that through us being one and being about the same thing, the world would know that Jesus is Jesus. Because Jesus is the hope of the world. And the local church, every local church is supposed to point to that hope, not stand in the way of it. And so many churches are standing in the way of that hope. I had a conversation with one of my friends this week, actually about church and I really just he told me his story agnostic and you know how his story started 
on why he doesn't really believe in Jesus and why. I mean, some real heavy stuff. Start with this. I grew up in church. Um, but his words, dumb church drama, my family dropped out when I was, you know, preteen. Never went back. Are you kidding me? Like, really? Dumb church drama. I didn't ask any questions. But we've all been there. We, f- we fight over music. Dumb church drama. We fight over what's the best outreach technique. D- dumb church drama. We fight over the best schedule for us. Dumb church drama. We fight over what we think we're not getting. Dumb church drama. I just feel like I'm not growing. Well, then grow. Can I just say this is a pet peeve of mine? And I'm sorry if I offend you this morning, but this is on my heart. It's not the elder's job. It's not my job. It's not Pastor Jerry's job to make you grow. As a follower of Jesus, it's your job. It's your job to put forth the effort necessary to grow in your faith. We want to help you do that, but it's not my responsibility. It's just not. It's my responsibility to help you in your faith journey. It's my responsibility to help you in the elders' responsibility and Pastor Jerry's responsibility to help empower you to make a difference in the world. You see, we're called to make disciples. And a lot of the times, I think that scares us. And here's why. Because it sounds so spiritual for me to say... I'm all about discipleship, and I'm just going to go deeper and deeper and deeper. It sounds really good and spiritual until you realize you're missing the point. Because to go deeper is to do what God's called you to do. When's the last time you told somebody about Jesus? When's the last time you invited somebody to church? When's the last time John 17, 20 through 21 was a reality in your life that we were one and we pointed to Jesus and saw a difference in the world? But no, see, we hide. We, we, we retreat into our little enclaves of Bible studies where we can feel safe and secure and never have to step out of our comfort zone and blame it on discipleship. No, we're called to make disciples, not hang out with the same disciples until Jesus comes back. Big difference. I'm going off topic. I'm sorry. Unity is always, or disunity is always an option, but unity should always be the goal. Unity should 100% always be the goal. It's what Jesus has called us to. I mean, think about it. You've got these two ladies to agree in the Lord. And these ladies have done some really good things. True companion, help these women. These women have labored side by side with me in the gospel together. These are not only just people in the church that are saved. These are not just people that come in and sit around. These are fellow workers with Paul who are making a difference. And they can't agree on something. And see, it's causing harm at the church at Philippi, just like it causes harm in every single local church that's existed since. One thing that these verses do you know, give me slight satisfaction in is through the different churches I've been in, and you see all these different arguments, it's nothing new under the sun. As long as people are involved, things will be difficult. As long as I'm involved, things will be difficult because I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. There's only one perfect person. His name is Jesus, and we're supposed to point to him. And when we try to make much of ourselves, when we try to build up our little measly kingdoms at the expense of God's great and glorious kingdom, shame on us because we're supposed to point to the greatest hope in the world, and his name is Jesus, and he takes precedent over every preference. Jesus takes precedent over every preference. It's why we do what we do. It's why we gather. It's why we worship. It's why we want to tell people about Jesus. Because there is a reality for most people in the world. That is eternal separation and damnation. Eternal separation from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
And I don't know about you, but I don't want to stand back and let that reality be true for my friends that are going to die and go to hell. I don't want to spend all my time arguing over stupid things that don't matter when there are people that are dying and going to hell. When there is a glorious kingdom. When there is a glorious God. When there is a man named Jesus who came to this earth and he lived a perfect life in our place that we could never live Even as followers of Jesus, we struggle with it. He lived in our place and he died on the cross for us. The death we all deserve because we're sinners and we're messed up and we're screwed up. And we all have our problems and issues because of that. We're separated from God, but God said, no, that's not my plan for you. And so Jesus died and three days later he was raised from the dead and he did defeat death and hell and sin and all bad things that whosoever would believe in him would never perish but have everlasting life. This is the reality that I want my friends to know. And how dare us, how dare me to be concerned with so many other things that don't matter. Let us be about the same thing. Let us be about Jesus, who is the hope of the world, and do whatever is necessary and whatever it takes to make his name known in our community and beyond. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you for your love and grace. We thank you that you have given us what we need to be united that you would not have prayed this prayer if it were impossible. And Jesus, I pray that when you look at our church, in light of what you prayed 2,000 years ago, you would say, amen for those guys. God, I want to make the biggest difference and the greatest impact that I can for your kingdom. I want this church to make the biggest impact for your kingdom. Let us all choose today to focus on the main thing. Let us focus on you and what you've done and what you're doing and what you desire to do. that I would not think myself so important that I would stand in the way and cause a hindrance to my friend who if he were to die right now, he would spend an eternity from you. Let me not love me that much. Let us not love us that much. Let us love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbor as ourselves. And when we leave this afternoon and we go have lunch with our families, when we go to whatever restaurant, when we start the work week tomorrow, we would, in the very mundane and boring aspects of life, live for you and you alone in your kingdom. Lord, we pray that your kingdom would come. And our kingdoms would fall away. Less of us so that you could be glorified through us. You're more important, Jesus. You are better. You're better. And I pray that we would revel in that. And that you would be glorified through us. In Jesus' name, amen.